And now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chief Technology and Strategy Officer, Networking and Security, Guido Abenzella. <laughs> All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Excited to be here today. Had a lot of uh, fun on the main stage this morning, you know, um, talking about multi-cloud. We'll see a little bit of that more here today. And um, that's the clicker. Here's the clicker. So the main thing I want to talk about today um, is, is the future of NSX. Right? And um, let, me, let me set this up a little bit. Right? We're living in the IT industry. And you know, one thing about the IT industry is that it's constantly changing. Right? I personally think it's a great thing. You get to play with new toys all the time. You know, there's new technologies coming along. Um, but at the same time, it means you have to constantly reinvent yourself, learn new skills. Right? It's, uh, but it's, it's just how the industry works. Right now, IT is going through a particularly big revolution. Right? Uh, we're going from classic client-server computing to cloud computing. And that's a particularly big change for all areas, and that includes networking. So if right now what's happening in networking seems fairly confusing compared to, say, 10 years ago, I think it's completely normal and expected. Right? I mean, you know, for the longest time in networking, the models didn't change. You bought switches the same way. You operated them the same way. And suddenly, everything now is, is breaking down. We have many new trends. And so in this talk, I want to, want to share how, how we think NSX can be a bridge for you to that future of networking. While networking changes, we think NSX is a great platform to, uh, to move along with these changes. And some of you may have seen this slide before, right, where, where we're really seeing NSX no longer just as a tool for the data center, but as a tool that allows you to connect many different types of endpoints, endpoints such as virtual machines, virtual desktops, you know, mobile devices, containers. We saw this morning the public clouds, like Amazon, Azure, uh, Google, um, you know, branch offices. We heard from, briefly from um, Columbia that they're now tackling SD-WAN with NSX. So there's three topics I want to talk about today, and uh, which are, the first one is software independence from hardware and networking. The second one is how the ap application is evolving. And the third one is cloud networking. And we also have some demos. As always, my spotlight sessions, they're 100% live. I hope they work. <laughs> but if they work, I think we'll, we'll have, a, have a lot of fun here. So before jumping into networking today, I want to go back in time a little bit and look at the history of IT, because there's a lot of things we can learn. And if you, if you look at IT, right, the, the first big model that evolved for information technology was the, the mainframe, right? And then a little bit later, the workstation. And they had one thing in common, which was that they were vertically integrated stacks. So I would buy a, you know, IBM mainframe or a Spark station. You know, my Spark station would have a, a, a Spark chip from Sun, Solaris OS from Sun. The Spark station itself was built by Sun. Everything from one vendor. And then the PC revolution happened. And this vertically integrated ecosystem started breaking apart. Right? Suddenly, I had a, a Dell system, but the CPU was from Intel, and the operating system was from Windows. So I had three different companies building the solution that I was using. Right? And the effect of the PC revolution was a Cambrian explosion of creativity. And if you look at it, every, I think pretty much every major software company today, IBM probably being the exception, was started during this time. Right. VMware, the very tail end of it. It's probably the last, last of the big ones. And then more recently, compute has gone through another big revolution. And we're going from this you know, three-layer stack um, where I have things from different vendors, but I still buy them together, to a new model where I actually can consume all of the hardware from a cloud provider as a service. I bring my own software, but the hardware is no longer mine. So why does this matter? Right? If you look at the, how we administer servers, right, there's been a huge change over the decades um, you know, when this revolution happened. So back when I was in, in 1996, I was a graduate student, you know, and uh, you know, one of the things I did was administer servers. And if I wanted to install new software um, on the server, what I would do is I would get a CD. Does anybody remember what a CD is? That were the silver disks you know, we had a long time ago? <laughs> I'm dating myself here. Uh, the terminal with a serial cable. We'll plug it into the server. I would uh, you know, start installing Linux, and with a little bit of luck, three hours later, I would have the system up and running. 
Now, how does it look like today? To install a new server, I go to a console, you know, maybe vSphere, maybe Amazon, pick an image, start it up. A few minutes later, my server is up and running. Right? My, the, the gain in productivity has been massive, and there's actually inter inter interesting industry studies that support that, that we've seen you know, between a factor of five and 10 productivity in, in server administration during that time. Now, this talks about networking, so let's look at networking for a second. In networking, for the longest period of time, this vertical integration of hardware did not change. Right? We, we had a, a, you know, a Cisco switch with a Cisco chip and Cisco software. And the net result of this was that the way how we manage networks also didn't evolve. Right? If you, uh, back in, in 96, when I was a grad student, I was also administering switches. And you know, I would take a terminal, I would type telnet, and then I would uh, you know, type uh, uh, I mean, CLI commands to set up that particular switch. How does that look like today? Very little change, right? The same CLI commands will probably still work. Um, you know, th there's actually one advance we've made, which is we went from Telnet to SSH. But that really is the extent of change in how, how network is administered in many cases, right? Now, that has started to change as well. And we're seeing this movement that, that hardware and software in networking are coming apart. Yeah? And for me personally, the, the first attempt at this was when I was a professor at Stanford. Um, you know, I was uh, running a little project there called OpenFlow. And uh, you know, the idea of OpenFlow was simple. It was like we, we add a little bit of software to a switch. We have an OpenFlow controller. The two talk to each other. And now we can buy a switch from one company, a controller from another company. And it's, it's a great way to run your network. It's a fantastic vision. I gave many talks about it. It never worked. <laughs> it, it, I don't know a single system today that really sort of follows this open flow idea of controller and, and switch from being from two different companies with an open protocol in between. Right? And I think the reasons they didn't work is, is twofold. I mean, one was I don't think switch vendors have the right incentives to support it. But I think the other one was we just underestimated how quickly this would evolve. Because the OpenFlow protocol, because it was a standard that needed to be agreed upon by all parties, evolved very slowly, while the systems that people built evolved very quickly. And so today, OpenFlow is used in many products under the hood with proprietary extensions. But so the standardized OpenFlow, I don't know a single deployment that uses that. The thing that did work was, was network virtualization. Right? And the idea here is to say, I'm actually separate hardware and software in a different way. I'm going to take the software and stick it in the hypervisor. And then underneath the network, I can operate now as a fairly simple fabric. So you know, this model worked a lot better. Right? And that's sort of what we know today. We have a, a hardware fabric underneath. We have all the hypervisors, hypervisor switches together form what we like to think of as a network hypervisor. And then on top of it, I can create arbitrary networks. And you know, bonus here is I can not only virtualize the capabilities that exist in the network today, but actually I can go beyond that. I can have a virtual firewall that doesn't even exist in my underlying hardware and, and create that with the network virtualization. Now, network virtualization typically uses some kind of overlay tunneling. And um, overlay tunneling has become a very common primitive, a very common building block for building networks today. Right? It's used actually at different levels. So for example, you see it being used at an app level, for example, swarm of containers creating a VXLAN mesh just, just for the container deployment. You see it at the next level, where you have, uh, for example, something like NSX creating different apps in an enterprise. And then yet another level, it's used by hardware vendors. For example, Cisco ACI uses it to efficiently establish a, a fabric with some hardware virtualization. And it's, it's, it's kind of funny, but the, the, I think the reason why overlays became so successful is that you can nicely stack them on top of each other. There's very little support you need in the underlying infrastructure, the layer below you, to make them happen. The downside is you get overhead, right? Um, I'm still looking for a customer that actually runs three layers of VXLAN on top of each other. But I found multiple customers that are running the bottom, uh, the bottom two or the top two. So I think it's just a question of time before we find somebody who runs all. Um, and you know, the, the, the downside, obviously, is you get this header stacking, right? <laughs> VXLAN three levels deep is not exactly pretty. Uh, you know, you have many headers on top of each other. It creates overhead, makes it hard to debug these networks. Um, so we hopefully will we'll go back to a, to a world where while you have meshes 
you know, you have one layer of, of, of VXLAN, possibly two sometimes, but not more. So that's network virtualization. You know, the idea to separate, for example, with NSX, right, to have a software layer that's independent of the, the software layer of the switch. But there's actually some, some customers that are going one step further, and they're actually purchasing a, a bare metal switch, um, meaning a switch without any software, and then they get the software from a different vendor. That may seem like an original idea, but if you think about it, for servers, we've done this for a decade now, right, or two. Yeah. And uh, so this, is, this movement is called bare metal switching. Um, most of the hyperscale operators are doing that way, right? Cisco, uh, sorry, um, Google, when they buy a switch, right, they, they just buy the hardware, right? and, and then they put their own software on top. Or they may actually build the hardware at this point, but, but you know, there's many of these, these hyperscale operators running with bare metal. So I'd like to welcome on stage here, uh, you know, uh, uh, one of our customers is actually using NSX on top of a bare metal switch um, uh, you know, uh, hardware together with um, another software in between. Um, it's from one of the, the largest securities trading companies um, in the world, uh, Nomura. You may remember them from, from buying Lehman Brothers. Please welcome Eguchi San. Mm -hmm. So it's, thank you for making the trip from, from Japan here to the United States. Uh, it's great to have you. So can you tell us a little bit about what NRI, Nomura Research Institute, and that's the spun out IT group from Nomura, the whole company. Can you tell me what does NRI do? Sure. Uh, there are whole main segments in our business. Uh, our largest business is in the financial segment, uh, where our solutions have a market share of somewhere between 50 to 80 percent. And we also provide private cloud and system development uh, services to many customers in manufacturing and the public sectors and so on. Perfect. So um, let's talk a little bit about, about, about how you run um, IT and, and so, you know, your, uh, your, 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 your network. So what led NRI to, to consider network virtualization? Uh, yes. Uh, we uh, provide 24 service, uh, service uh, monitoring services uh, for more than 100 customers uh, in addition to monitoring our own service platform. Historically, we have deployed monitoring servers, firewalls, and routers dedicated to each and every system to provide uh, monitoring for networking devices uh, running in these systems. This was a very expensive approach due to the number of networking devices yeah. required for the monitoring infrastructure. Makes sense. Uh, open costs were also very high because the management was not centralized and the changes were made in a box-by-box -box basis, resulting in low agility. This led us to consider virtualizing these network functions. Makes sense. So um, what was the particular, so you're running NSX, right, in your, um, in your cloud. What particularly led you to choosing NSX? Uh, we have chosen NSX mainly for three reasons. Firstly, uh, centralized management. Secondly, uh, cost effectiveness. Lastly, our existing under network was based on big switch networks. This uh, enables us to automate not only the over network, but the uh, under network as well. We have put uh, NSX into production this June and have not run into any issues since. Very nice. So let's let me reinforce this point, right? So why my, um, uh, I asked Iguchi to fly all the way from Japan to here to talk about this. So the the physical hardware you're using is from which vendor again? Yes. So which, which company makes the switches? Uh, Acton. So it's Acton, right? So you may Acton, know Acton as an, um, a white box manufacturer, right, or, or an OED. And then the software, but they come without any software, right? Uh, Big Switch. So you, you have separate software from Big Switch that runs on top, right? So this is really interesting, right? I think it's a, it's a very new trend, um, you know, that, um, that's just, uh, just starting. So, so what's next for you? What's the roadmap 
for NSX at NMI? Uh, as we've done with uh, our monitoring system, uh, we'd like to uh, improve our operation efficiency using uh, NSX in other areas like uh, financial systems and uh, industrial systems. Uh, where we have also already deployed big switch networks as the uh, SDN and array. And uh, we also uh, plan to uh, take advantage of NSX to capability to seamlessly integrate with the public clouds to continue to support our globalizing customer systems. Super. Well, thank you, thank you very much for being here today. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, I know how hard it is to, to uh, you know, present in English. I've, I've tried presenting in Japanese. It was not pretty, uh, even though I lived there for a while. So fantastic English. Thank you very much. Iguchi. Thank you very much. All right. So that was number one. Hardware and software are separating, and that, that creates very interesting trends and, and new uh, opportunities. So the second big trend I want to talk about is how the application is evolving. Right? As we start moving workloads to the cloud and, and more generally to you know, more complex environments, the tools that we use to build them are no longer the same. Right? An application today, you know, an application used to run on a single server, but an application today, you know, I don't know, if you take a phone and you tweet, for example, I don't even know what happens on the back end, but you know, I'm, I'm sure this tweet will, you know, within seconds, go through various load balancers, firewalls, you know, all kinds of services will get copied, will get replicated, and will, will move uh, you know, around a large number of systems. And because of this trend in, in application development, we've seen a different set of tools and, and architectures emerge to build these applications, right? And the, the architectures are typically called, the architectures are called microservices, and the, the tool of choice are, are containers. Right? Um, there are different words for this approach, right? I think uh, you know, cloud native is typically how we call it. IDC calls it third platform. I think Gartner, it's more or less what they call mode two. My favorite term is hipster SOA. If anybody remembers service-oriented architectures, um, the but the, the basic idea is that I compose an application out of these microservices. Each of them has a well-defined API. They have, um, you know, they, they 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 talk to each other, but but each Individual microservice is basically this typically scale-out group um, of containers. Um, you know that here we go. That uh, you know basically based on demand becomes more or less right. Has some connectivity on the inside, but on the outside you have this this very well-defined interface of what traffic is allowed in or out. Right. So if you build such a microservice, you essentially set up an equity policy already at at this microservice level. Right. For for a group of containers. And so the typical architecture is that, you know, in front of the containers you have a load balancer because you want to take the incoming traffic and balance it across your containers. You have a firewall to keep bad stuff out, and then you're, you're uh, upstream to the router. If you actually t build such an app and deploy it, you typically would deploy it on a container host. Right? And today, at least in the enterprise, I would say pretty much 100% of customers that I know um, are running containers inside of virtual machines. Right? And that may initially, so when I saw it for the first time, it really surprised me, because I was always thinking, aren't containers replacing VMs? You know, why would you, would you stack them? But the, the issue is that containers today typically rely on the kernel for separation. Right? So there, there's kernel primitives being used that basically put each container in a jail, and it can't. And the, the attack surface of a, of a kernel is much, much higher than the attack surface of, of a hypervisor. Right? If you think about it, if I want to break out of a hypervisor, I can't call any functions. My, my best bet is probably to jump into a driver and, and see if I can pass some parameters that, uh, where I can break out of the driver. On the Linux kernel, on the other hand, I have, I don't know how many functions a modern Linux kernel has, frankly, but my guess is it's you know, in, the, in the thousands. Um, so I have just much, much more different opportunities I can explore to see if I can find a bug somewhere and break out. Right? The, the numbers bear this out. If you look at the... The kernel, uh, the kernel mailing lists, the number of vulnerabilities that allowed a container breakout over the last year you know, was probably in the 10 to 20 range. The number of hypervisor exploits we've seen for ESX over the past couple of years, to my knowledge, are zero, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's very, very rare. It's very, very, very hard to break out. And that's why people are putting these, these containers inside of VMs to basically have an extra layer of defense. Right? 
Um, and there's another nice benefit because if you have a hypervisor here, we can put network virtualization into the hypervisor. Right? So here, for example, we have an attacker. For those that, that saw Scott and, and myself uh, last year, you know, we, we did the whole demo. But if somebody tries to break into your, your container and then tries to, they can compromise the container, but if they try to propagate from there, there's a firewall um, that will stop them. That's provided by, for example, NSX. Right? And uh, if we detect this attempt, because NSX can also notify us, we can then say, okay, if that happens, we take the container, we put it on a special you know, incident response network, maybe with a honeypot or so, right? We just plug it into this other virtual network. And then we see how the container behaves. You know, does it try to infect other machines? We can study its behavior. And, uh, you know, maybe we can scan it for ports, any other ports open, so we can figure out which, which command control traffic it's using. But basically, all the tools we have with NSX for, for classic VM-based networking on-premise today, we can now use for containers as well. Here comes the scan. So we said we need to do networking at a container level, right? Um, because the the uh, you know the, the developer wants to define the rules, uh, you know how container you know is firewalled off, how the load balancer works, and so on. But then we need to do networking again at an IT level, right? Because we want to say I have a, an app that's written with containers, and in the internal networking is well defined. But now this should talk to my VMware-based applications, or maybe I have some hardware-based ones where I'm using VTAP or so on, but I want to integrate it with the whole rest of my data center, right? So that's why we think this actually makes a lot of sense to leverage something like NSX to provide both the container networking and the virtual machine networking, you know, in your data center. And of course, then with, you know, things like end-user computing, you can even take mobile devices and integrate that, or, you know, VDI desktops. So in order to integrate containers with NSX, we actually have to do two different types of integration. Right? Let me explain why. So if you provision a couple of containers, right, you typically would talk to some kind of scheduler, and uh, the scheduler would essentially spin up these containers on a couple of hosts. So for example, here it's, it's Docker. Um, but if you want to really have a good user experience, then we also, at the same time, need to create the corresponding networks in an automatic way. Right? If we, Developer creates a couple of containers and then has to call IT support or file a ticket and say, hey, can you please create a new network for me and map these containers individually on the network? That wouldn't work, right? That would completely defeat the idea of, of uh, you know, what sort of agile container development is. So we need to automate this. And, and what this means for us is we need two integration points. The first one is the scheduler integration between the scheduler and NSX. The second one's at the data path level where we will have to be able to provide the vSwitch and these new ports. With that, I've talked enough about containers. I want to give you a demo of what we can do with containers. And uh, I would like to welcome you know, a VMware favorite, Scott Lowe, on stage. Uh, so we're going to show you. All right. So we want to show you NSX with uh, Kubernetes, Docker, and Pivotal. Is that correct? That's right. All right. That's right. Can we switch over to the demo and take it away, Scott? OK. So we're going to show you integration. Uh, we're going to start out showing you some Kubernetes integration. Um, and what we're going to do real quick is uh, I'm just going to show you the YAML file that we're going to use. And that's way too small, so let me just increase that size for you a little bit. This is just a simple YAML file that uh, describes a replication controller inside uh, Kubernetes. So this replication controller, it's an object that Kubernetes uh, creates. It's going to turn, create, and manage for pods. And uh, you can see we have the definition for the pods there, what Docker image we're going to use, so on and so forth. I'll draw your attention here to... Uh, it's a line 13 where we're, we're assigning a label, a Kubernetes label um, that says the security group and has a value of web tier. And we're going to actually use that metadata inside NSX to apply security policy to help make sure that we don't have a similar sort of issue that we saw last year, right? Yep. So uh, there's the YAML file. Let's drop back to the command line. We're just going to use the standard kubectl tool. And uh, we're going to do a get namespace. As we see, there's a single namespace called default. I'm going to go ahead and create a new namespace. And this corresponds to... Uh, creating uh, a logical switch inside NSX. And just to prove that this is indeed live, you can see now we have the NSX uh, demo logical switch or namespace created. And then we'll use kubectl to deploy the replication controller I just showed you into that namespace. And so we see that the replication controller has been created. And I can flip back up here and do a get replication controllers. You see that it's there, but what we're really interested in is the pods. 
And you can see I have four pods. One of them is still in the process of uh, being created. If I run it again, you can see now they're all up and running. So we've, we've created a namespace. We've deployed a replication controller. That replication yep. controller, in turn, has created four pods, scheduled them onto the Kubernetes cluster, and connected them uh, to the backend networking. Now let's uh, flip over to NSX and see what that looks like. All right. So we'll start out with the logical switching section. And you'll look in here and you'll say, wait a minute, Scott, I don't see NSX demo. That's OK. Don't worry. Right? We'll just refresh. There's NSX demo. The logical switch shows up. That corresponds to the NSX demo namespace. And if we take a look at this, you'll see that we have uh, five logical ports that are here. One of those logical ports is the upstream logical router that handles the routing for these pods. And the other four are the container interfaces for the actual pods themselves. So now, um, mention the label, right? Let's go to the inventory section here. And we have a group called Web Services. And if I look at this group and I show you the membership criteria, here you see that we're pulling in that metadata that we defined in the YAML file. So we, in the YAML file, we specified a security group called Web Tier. Here it says if a logical port gets created and has that value assigned, we're going to put it into the Web Services group. And that's in turn important because we have a firewall policy that says if you're a member of the Web Services group, you can't talk to another member of the Web Services group. So this will prevent you know, that sort of nasty issue that we saw last year when we were hacking yep. uh, Docker containers, right? Segregation. Right. Segregation, that's right. Perfect. No lateral movement. So let's see uh, how this works, right? I'm just going to... Um, so you log into one of the containers. I'm going to log into one of the containers, right? So I just got to find the uh, thing. We'll just pick one of these containers here. And we're going to run a bash shell. All right, so we just executed a bash shell inside the container. We'll look at the IP address that it has. It's a 10.2.0.2. You can see that guy's uh, listed uh, right here, right? Now I know because I set this environment up that the upstream router is at 10201. And if I ping that, you see that I do have upstream connectivity, so I have north-south connectivity. But let's try and ping one of the other containers. I got nothing there. Okay, that's fine. Let's try four. Okay, nothing. Five. Okay. So now just to verify that this is working correctly, that we're not, you know, got some black hole uh, uh, pods out here, let's actually flip over and open up a session to a Kubernetes, to a load balance we have in front of that. And so you can see this is from the outside traffic coming into the load balance environment. You can see the private IP address of the pod and you see that we are refreshing and getting a different pod. So we are dynamically creating logical ports inside NSX as we spin up Kubernetes pods and applying a security policy using standard Kubernetes tools. Fantastic. So that was pretty fast, both speaking and the <laughs> demo here. I got a lot um, to cover, so you know. Let me sort of play back in slow motion, right? What, what happened here? So you, you basically just used the standard Docker, uh, sorry, Kubernetes controls, yep. right? And said, I want to spin up a couple of containers, right? Indirectly. With a, and um, this automatically plugged them into the right network based on the tags that you'd used and put the right policy on them. That's correct. Right. That's correct. So, so the nice thing here is if, if I was a developer and I was developing with Kubernetes, I could do everything exactly the same way I did it before, right? I could use the same commands. I did not even need to know that NSX existed, plus minus the tagging maybe, but you know, that's, uh, that's basically a very simple thing for me. And, but at the same time, say you are the IT team, right? You can use all the same tools that you're using to administer, you know, classic VMs or, or VDI or, or, you know, Amazon instances. You can all, use all of those tools now for containers. You're absolutely right. Perfect, good. So down. We, we know that sometimes, you know, may, maybe you don't want to do Kubernetes. So let's show you what it looks like just with straight up Docker. Perfect. All right. So again, we're going to be using native tools. I'm just going to run the Docker network command. Um, this shows the networks that Docker knows about. You can see there's some standard kind of bridge and host networks. No big deal there. We're just going to go create a couple of commands, a couple of networks here. Docker network create. We'll specify that these are NSX based networks. And I'm going to add a little bit of metadata through this options command that will add some stuff that NSX will use to pick up and apply security policy to Docker containers placed on this Docker network. So I create one called web with uh, IP sets uh, metadata, and I'll create another one called management with, naturally, a management set of metadata. And you see that it returns some UUIDs, and so we have one AED is web and three F9C is the other. So let me go in here and log back into NSX manager. And I'll show you that when we go into the logical switching section, right, you'll see one AED, three uh, F9. Uh, you know, those are the two networks that we just created, right? And they have one logical board associated with them, and that is, again, a logical router that is automatically created to take care of traffic coming on and off those, uh, those networks. Now, we're going to use Docker Compose just to uh, 
uh, simplify the process of creating Docker containers on this. Now, this is a Docker Swarm cluster that we have running. And we've created some NSX-backed uh, networks on this Docker Swarm cluster. And here we have a YAML file in which we've defined two services, a web service using the same NSX demo Docker image we used just a moment yep. ago Kubernetes, and a management service using just a standard Ubuntu uh, image, right? And then we have some affinity stuff to help with scheduling with the Swarm schedule, that sort of stuff, right? And we'll instantiate these just using a pretty standard Docker Compose up, all right? And it's going to go off. It's going to create... Uh, the number of containers and the appropriate pieces, plumb them to the networks that were defined. You may have noticed in that YAML file we said web network, management network. When I come back over here to the logical switching section, you'll see the logical ports go from one to two. So we're dynamically attaching Docker containers to this NSX logical switch. Um, also, I mentioned that metadata, if we go down here and look at this grouping mechanism called IP sets, you'll see that that dash O option I specified, management web, means that Docker containers being added to those logical switches automatically get populated into an IP set, right? And just to prove, again, that this is actually live, we're going to go back to the command line, and we're going to do a Docker Compose scale. And the scale command just allows us to say, I want to run multiple instances of a container defined in the YAML file. So Docker Compose scale management 2, web 2. That's going to spin up another management container, another web container. All right, if I go here and refresh, you will see that automatically the IP sets are being populated, pulling in that metadata. We have a firewall policy that's using those IP sets that says allow web traffic to those web containers, allow SSH traffic to the management containers, allow ICMP to the management containers. Notice there's no rule that allows IP ICMP to the web containers, right? So let's verify. I'm going to go back over here just so I can see the IP addresses in the background here. And let's try pinging one of those web servers real quick, uh, which is on the 10.0.0 network. All right, we got nothing. Let's see if we can ping one of the management servers. Okay, there we go. We got connected to the management server. Good. Success. That's right. So now let's find out if our allow HTTP to the web containers is working. So I have an HA proxy that's sitting in front of these guys. And bam, there you go. There is the web services being allowed to the Docker containers per our firewall policy. And again, if I refresh, you can see that we actually have multiple containers running behind that. Perfect. Beautiful. Two, two demos in a row that worked. I'm getting nervous. Go on. Okay. Let's see if we can make it three. All right. So we've shown you Kubernetes. We've shown you straight up Docker. Um, let's suppose that your organization is using a platform as a service, something like Pivotal Cloud Foundry. And you just want to be able to take applications and do a CF push and have them run. So here you can see in this terminal window, I've already pushed an application for the interest of time. I have a back-end application that I've already pushed up to our platform. And you can see that it's running. It's got one instance. Everything's great there. All right. Now, I'm going to go ahead and um, change into a different directory, and I'm going to do a CF push for another application, so that's running in the background while I show you what this looks like inside NSX. All right, and you can see the, the terminal will scroll along in the background as it does its stuff. We're going to log into NSX here. We'll go to the logical switches session. We see a PCF containers logical switch with one port on it, right? And if I take a look at this piece while the other application is being pushed, and I show you some of these tags that are down here. Uh, oh, I actually need to go to the port, sorry. Go to ports. And then here's that logical port. I can show you the tags on this logical port, and you'll see that it's actually tagged with the app name that I'd already pushed. I pushed an app called Backend. We captured that metadata again in NSX and, uh, and added it to the logical port. So it's there. Now, there's also other ways we could look at this. I want to show you guys for just a moment. We have a search functionality built in here. And so I can search on that tag, and I see I find the port, the back-end port, which is the name of the application. And again, you can see that it's finding that tag there. And so because we have this metadata, we can, uh, we can assign security policy to it. We could do automatic grouping, just like we did the Kubernetes and Docker, right? Now, my application is finished uh, pushing here. So if I do a CF apps, you'll see I have two applications, a front-end application yep. and now a back-end application. So let's see what happens here in NSX. If I go back to my logical switches and refresh this display, you'll see that I now have two ports on the PCF container switch, switch, which yep. means we've automatically plumbed the front-end application into that switch. And if I were to go and search for front-end, you would see that it finds the front-end uh, logical port with that tag associated, right? Um, so cool, everything's working. Now again, you know, we might want to scale this application, so I can just do a CF scale uh, to increase the number of uh, instances of the back-end application running, so I increase that to two. 
And if I flip back over here to NSX, bam, now I have three logical ports. And if I do my search, again, you'll see that if I can type correctly, you now have two logical ports that are associated with yep. the backend application. So again, dynamically pushing applications, pushing applications using standard Cloud Foundry tools, dynamically attaching them, capturing all the metadata, and then being able to do security policy, which we didn't demonstrate for purposes of time, but being able to do that with those ports as well. Perfect. Well, thanks, Scott. I'm sure we set some kind of world record here in uh, you know, three heterogeneous uh, container but never virtualization deployments in the shortest amount of time or something. That's right, absolutely. <laughs> All right, thanks, Guido. Awesome, thank you very much. <laughs> All right, so that was containers. And you know, the, the, the key takeaways here, no change for the developer. They can provision networks with the native tools from the container system. But at the same time, your IT team now has full visibility into every single container. You can firewall every container, you can lock down containers, you can monitor the traffic if you think it's compromised, you can tap the traffic, and you can integrate it with the rest of your data center. You know, VMs, hardware, you know, VDI, whatever else you may be running. Very, very powerful. So that's the second big trend I want to have a look at, and that is the evolution of the application. And then there's the third thing, cloud networking. And uh, you know, the, the, you saw this already this morning, obviously, in the keynote. Um, but if you, if you just look at this, you know, this, this diagram here, it's clear that the network evolution isn't over yet. Right? We, we, we're going one step further, um, which is basically networking where you don't control the hardware. Right? Just like with cloud computing, computing where you don't control the hardware, we're now doing that with networking. Now, cloud networking probably sounds like the mother of all buzzwords. Right? <laughs> so, so let me first try to convince you there really is a difference here. And um, you know how I want to do this uh, starts in Bryce Canyon. Um, so this is a beautiful shot of Bryce Canyon. I was actually there uh, three weeks ago. My kids were in Columbia Sportswear, if you remember from this morning. And you know, I was there, and uh, I still had to work a little bit. So I was actually making the first draft of the slides for this session here today, while I was in, in Bryce Canyon. I actually wasn't making them here. This would have been the perfect spot, except they have no Wi-Fi. Where I actually made the slides was in the pizza and coffee place in the parking lot of the lodge. Uh, they had reliable Wi-Fi. Smelled a little like cheese, but uh, you know, you got the work done. And while I was sitting there, I was basically working with my laptop on things we were doing on Amazon. Right? So here's a packet trace of me working you know, at uh, the Bryce Canyon Lodge. And if you look at it, uh, you know, the packet trace starts the first hop, that's the, the lodge, you know, run by the National Park Services or the, the contractor. Then the next hop is uh, South Central Communications, right? That's the local ISP. Then it goes into the uh, backbone from Hurricane Electric, and then to an Equinox peering point, and then jumps into the Amazon network. That's a very typical, you know, uh, path for a packet that goes from a, you know, it comes from a, a, a mobile access point. So I have two questions. The first one is, actually, first need to introduce. Everybody know who this, this person is? No? Baskeyer, he's the CIO of VMware. So he's my CIO, right? He runs all of the IT at VMware. Which of the switches in this packet trace does he control? Not a single one, right? They're all by some other organizations. Second question, if I'm working there, and because of me working there, there's a compromise at VMware, and somebody steals a lot of data. Would he still get fired? Probably yes, right? So to me, that really is the reality of cloud networking. You don't control any of the hardware anymore, but you're still responsible for security and, and networking, and if something bad happens, you know, you are on the line. Right? And it's clear that, that to do this, right, you need different technologies than what you had before. There's no hardware in the world which can help you solve this problem. Right? So if you look at, you know, I talked to, to a lot of enterprise customers about how they're managing this, and it's actually a really hard problem, right? And I just want to focus on the, on the data center cloud side of this, right? If you're running, um, start to run applications in the cloud, right? In, in my example, I was working in Amazon. The, the capabilities that Amazon networking gives you, right, first of all, are limited. You know, it's like very simple things, like you can't change an IP address while an instance is running, or uh, you, know, you, have, you have very limited in terms of uh, peering and, and routing and, and bridging what you can do. But you know, the, the, the other challenge is that it's different for each and every cloud. Amazon is arguably the best of these, right? So 
you as an IT team, how do you create networks that go across the different clouds? And, and that's sort of what gave us the idea for the demo we did here last year, which was the, uh, you know, where we showed for the first time networking Amazon Azure, and then what we presented earlier, um, uh, you know, this morning, uh, the, the, the bigger vision of how NSX works across these clouds. So I want to show you essentially a similar demo as the one we've seen this morning, but with a lot more detail and explain to you how this actually works and, you know, what are all the things that happened here, which, you know, we couldn't show on main stage. And to that, I'd like to welcome on stage, you know, one of the architects of uh, NSX for multi-cloud. Please welcome Mukashira. Hi, Guido. So, hey, can we switch over to the demo? Can we switch over to the demo? Oh, perfect. Here we go. Hi. Hey, good on. So, uh, so this is NSX. Is, is this actually is this NSX SaaS or is it running on premise right now? So this uh, this could be consumed as a SaaS or you could deploy it as a product on prem or in the cloud. Either way, this is okay. your single pane of glass for managing workloads on prem and in the public cloud. So this, I'm excited to be here today to show the cross -clou cross cloud capabilities in NSX. So this is your entry point. This is your single pane of glass. And if you click on the clouds icon, as an IT administrator, I have already entered my cloud credentials. So it's pulling in my uh, VPCs in AWS. Right. So it's, it's just using the Amazon API. It's using the Amazon VPCs. API. It's very straightforward. Right. So as you can see, I have three VPCs in AWS. Uh, so as an IT administrator, if I was to go deploy NSX in AWS in a VPC, yep. all I would do is click on the VPC and say deploy NSX. In this case, I want to do a greenfield application, so there are no existing IP addresses to migrate, so I'm going to select the new application IP addresses. So this is actually a really interesting choice, right? You can, you can deploy NSX for the clouds in two ways. You can say, I want to inherit the underlying IP addresses, right? So basically, my, my new IP space is the same. I want to pick a completely different one, right? And we give you a lot more flexibility there than what Amazon gives you. For example, uh, you know, if, if you want to reuse the same IP space or something like that, Amazon is typically not possible, right? And, and with this, we can actually do that. So as an IT administrator, I would just go ahead and deploy on this VPC. Now, what this is doing in the background, it's deploying a gateway in the VPC. The gateway acts as a local control plane for the VMs in the VPC, as well as a data plane for the north-south traffic coming yep. in and going out of the VPC. It's sort of a perimeter defense. Exactly. Yeah. Of, of the, of so the if I refresh my new VPC, you can see that a new gateway is initializing in the VPC. Now, in the interest of time, uh, we will go to a production VPC where we have pre-deployed a gateway. Yep. And we launch a three-tier web app in the yep. VPC. So here so the, I have... The, the challenge here is spinning up instance in Amazon. It takes a couple of minutes. If we do this multiple times, it will take a lot of minutes. We need to be out of here in 15. So um, that part we just pre-baked. Right? So in the production VPC, I have no workloads yet. This is my production VPC. The gateway is pre-deployed. Yep. So spinning up there? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Let's look at the developer side of things. Now, in, in that production VPC as a developer, I want to launch this three-tier web app uh, with uh, two web VMs, an app VM, and a database VM on their respective logical switches connected by a logical router. Yeah. So as a developer, what I've done is I've just written a simple script that uh, interacts with the EC2 APIs and launches uh, instances just as you would do with Amazon. All I'm doing is I'm tagging them with the logical switch I want the VM to belong to, the security group that I want the VM to belong to. In the case of the web VM, I want it to have a public IP. So I specify a public IP for Makes the sense. web yeah. VM. All right, let's get them started here. So this is my little script that will deploy a database VM followed by an app VM and two web VMs. Yeah. And for the web VM, I've specified a public IP. So the database VM has started initializing. Next step, it's doing the app VM and onto the web VM. The web VM has a public IP. Perfect. This is all spinning up. Yeah. Finally, the second web VM. So let's go to the production VPC. My VMs are being launched and now. A few minutes depending. and the app should be all ready. Pretty fast here. 
Should we go back to the slides for? Can we yeah. go back to the slides for a second? So a couple of things. So the first one is you actually you started the the instances in Amazon all via APIs. All via APIs. Yeah. You know that it's DevOps, right? I think it's it's something we're going to see a lot more in the enterprise. Right? You want to automate the processes for deploying applications, and uh, Amazon has great APIs. is a very very good way um, to do it. So I want to briefly talk about what actually is running on Amazon here, right? And um, if you look at the, the architecture diagram, um, you can see at the bottom, so in this case, the model is an NSX that's deployed on-premise and manages cloud workloads, right? So we have, you see in the data center, we have a, a classic NSX setup, right? We have uh, the management layer, we have the control plane, and then we have the edge functionality. That's where, you know, all the traffic goes in and out, um, the, the enterprise is being managed. But the new thing here is all the, thing, the parts at the top. We have three workloads. Uh, we have uh, you know, uh, one Windows, two Linux, um, running on Amazon. Um, they have an agent in there. And this agent, you can think of it as basically being a little vSwitch, but it runs inside the instance, right? inside my, my Amazon instance. So if you think about it, you may wonder, is that secure if you run an, an agent inside? So what good is firewalling if it's inside the instance? Because if somebody breaks into the instance, they can just turn off the firewall. Right? So it turns out there's a couple of tricks we can do to actually make this much, much harder. And, and basically what we do is we take all of the, the, the uh, instances, there's a VPC around them, then we take the VPC and we um, essentially uh, uh, firewall it off and only allow connections to the gateway. Right? The second thing we do is that we, inside the VPC, we only allow VXLAN tunnels. So if you compromise one of the instances, the only thing you can do is create a VXLAN tunnel to the gateway uh, or to another um, um, switch in the gateway. And then we can do the same firewall enforcement on the other side. Right? So basically, the security model is actually fairly similar to what you get on-premise. If you just compromise a single um, instance, I would argue there's actually no difference between the two. Right? So below the instance, you see the cloud gateway. And that's basically our perimeter defense. Right? So that has the firewall settings for anything coming in. Um, it also manages the connection down to the edge, to my on-prem world, right? Um, we need this sort of in-between as a, as a control point just to make sure nobody can launch a DOS attack on your on-premise deployment, right? They may be able to, comp to, to launch a DOS attack on a gateway, if they, but, but this is of a self-contained unit. But basically, the gateway is a hardened instance, so breaking to that is much, much harder. And then the NSX manager can talk to the, uh, you know, to the, to the cloud plugin, and the cloud plugin talks to the, to the management portal, and this allows us things such as setting up the VPC correctly, spinning up the gateway instances, and doing all the things that we need in order to onboard these networks. Hmm? Correct. Correct. We're sitting cleanly on top of Amazon. Make sense? And uh, so this is if you deploy NSX on premise. <coughs> What we showed you this morning was the, the opposite case, where NSX actually sits up in the cloud, right? And it ends up looking um, fairly similarly, right? We basically now have NSX Manager Control and Edge running in the public cloud, but the way how we manage the networks in the public cloud is essentially the same, right? And by the way, all of this is a tech preview, right? This is not as available today, but this gives you an idea of what we're currently working on in the labs. Good. Should we try to go back? How are we looking? Yeah. We still need more time, or we're good? Oh, I think they're up now. All right, can we switch back to the demo? Yeah, so I'm going to go. refresh my production VPC. And you can see my four VMs have come up in oh, the production VPC. Perfect. The cloud agent is available. Instances are up. If I look at my logical switches, here is my AWS web logical switch with the two logical ports for the VMs and the router port to the upstream router. My app logical switch has the, log has the VM logical port and the upstream router port, and similarly, the, D the DB logical switch has the VM logical port and the upstream router port. Let's see if the application has gone live. So this is the public IP I gave for the application, and this is my application Perfect. in the public cloud Everything in works. Amazon. So you now have the application fully controlled with NSX. We can use firewall, and we can use tapping, basically all the features you know from NSX we can use. And we can plug this into the whole rest of our infrastructure. So for example, I could take, um, let's say, VDI, and I could say, you know, if somebody using a VDI instance is in the Active Directory group, Mukesh's app users, then he's allowed to access these servers. Otherwise, he isn't. Right? So basically, all this, this power you can now unleash 
even across clouds. Yeah, so this is actually live, so you're welcome to go to this IP address if you would like. Now, the next thing is to make sure the app is secure. Yeah. Right? So, oh, yeah. Very secure. Okay. So, no nest, no nested, nothing. This is just the agent's just running in, inside the instance. So this is the firewall screen in the NS, NSX manager, and we've defined some firewall policies. The first one is saying deny all traffic from the web group to the web group. Yeah. Because they don't need to talk to each other. If somebody was to break in into one web VM, you don't want him to move horizontally and you know attack the other web VMs. Similarly, we have a rule that denies traffic from the web to the DB. Because again, if somebody breaks into the web, you don't want him to gain access to the DB, and the web tier doesn't really need to talk to the DB tier. So let's see let's these firewall policies in, in action. So I'm going to log into one of the web VMs and one and the app VM. So from, sorry, I'm pinging beyond. So from the from web one, I cannot ping web two. Okay, yeah. So it's shut down. I cannot ping the DB VM. Mm -hmm. I can yeah. certainly ping the app VM because the app, or the super free tier app is working. Now from the app VM, I can ping the DB VM. So from the web, I could not ping the DB. From the app, I can. So, super, NSX fantastic firewall policy that worked. Great work. It's fine. And the demo worked as well. <laughs> All right, that was it. Thank you so much, you. Mukesh. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. So, you also saw this morning um, NSX uh, as a SaaS. And then um, to show you a little bit more about that, uh, I'd like to um, welcome on stage um, Avai Buff. So we had a big dis discussion inside, uh, you know, our business unit, whether how easy or hard it is to, to get NSX as a SaaS service. Um, he ended the discussion by simply building it uh, as part of a hackathon. So incredible work. So, so what is different about NS running NSX as SaaS? What, what are the, the big things you had to change? So today when we consume NSX, we see that we have to do installations of manager, controllers, and a bunch of things. But when we say SaaS, we don't have to worry about any of these things. That is available to you just yeah. as a service. You can yeah. just start using it. And you don't have to worry about all of the so maintenance do, part of it. You do it. patching, you do life cycle uh, management, to bring up, up shut down. Yeah. Every, everything is taken care of us by us. Yeah, fantastic. So, you know, we thought about what it would be a fun way to, 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 uh, to demo uh, NSX um, as a service. And um, we picked a use case, but I'm not sure this is actually going to be a very common use case anytime soon, but we thought it would be a lot of fun, which is what we're going to do is we're going to use the SaaS version of NSX to actually manage networking for an on-prem hypervisor, right? which is sort of, the, I think, the opposite way how you would normally think about it. And you know, honestly, before, you know, uh, uh, for example, the folks at Citibank this morning, before they say, we're just going to run all of our uh, you know, data center network with a, with a control plane in the cloud, it's probably going to be another decade or two. right? Um, um, but on the other hand, for example, for branch offices, you know, where I only have a very small footprint or a small medium business, I think actually this over time could be an interesting yeah. option. So, so the interesting part is now we are actually running a hypervisor in our on-prem data center sitting in Palo Alto. Yeah. And we are going to actually manage it through NSX deploy in public cloud, which potentially can be consumed as a service. Perfect. So let us look at Please the... switch over to the demo, please. Yeah, here we go. So uh, this is the on-prem NSX uh, ESX hypervisor running. You can see its IP address is uh, a local IP address in a, inside a data center. Yeah. This hypervisor is, has the same app running as we just as the Mukesh uh, showed us, which is a three-tier app running on the on-prem data center with the IP address. Interestingly, but it has the same this, policy. Where is this actually physically located? It's, in, it's located in the Palo Alto office. In Palo Alto, now Palo Alto yeah. office. Yeah. So sitting yeah. somewhere in a room there. Yeah. Okay. Oops. Yeah. So it's just to show that it's live. <laughs> so we'll see the policy is defined as uh, from on-prem web to uh, on-prem web to it is drop. It's the same policy. And then yep. we have on-prem web to on-prem DB also drop. And let us see live this in action. Perfect. 
Let's give it a quick spin. Now we'll try to ping from our on-prem web one VM to an on-prem web two VM. It is blocked as the as the policy blocked was as defined. The policy: web servers not allowed to talk to each other. That's that's a good architecture. Also, we cannot ping to DB from the web, which is typically a blocked policy. So that is also blocked, but we can actually ping from web to app. Yeah. That, that's the policy that was defined. Now yep. let us see whether we can ping from our app to DB, which is also allowed. Okay, super. So the, keep going here, but the, the, the basic takeaway here is, you know, we, we took one NSX, in this case running in the cloud, we can manage cloud workloads, we can manage on-prem workloads, or we can have an on-prem NSX managing cloud and on-prem networks, right? It's, it's an amazing amount of flexibility, um, you know, and it, it all works works together. You have small branch offices, you can directly manage all of your private data center using NSX on cloud. Perfect. Yeah, so it's working. Thank you so much, Vaiba. Thank you, Gita. That was awesome. <laughs> we'll go back to the slides. So that's, that's really all I, I had here, right? Um, networking is changing. It's changing profoundly. It's changing because how we deliver networking is changing because hardware and software are separating. It's changing because the applications we're running on top are changing. You know, containers are coming. You may not use them a lot today in your organization, but they will be a big topic in the future. I'm absolutely sure of that. And uh, it's changing because we're moving more workloads up into the cloud. Um, but NSX is your bridge to the future. We showed you today. You, you know us already from on-premises, VMware, Hyper-V, KVM, in the future Hyper-V, and today KVM. You know us from virtual desktops, our VDI integration, our AirWatch integration for mobile devices. We showed you how to work with, with Docker, um, you know, Pivotal and Cloud Foundry, with Docker, Pivotal, and Kubernetes on the container side. We showed you how we work with public clouds, and there was another session here that talked about how we're working with branch offices. No matter what's going to happen in networking in the future, you know, NSX is your bridge to the same. Thank you.